started right away. The topic for today is the best diet for multiple sclerosis refresher. So I've done a couple of videos on the best diet for multiple sclerosis. But today we're going to talk about some of the really, really important insights that we have gained in coaching over 600 people in the Live Disease Free Academy. Most of those students are recovering or have recovered from multiple sclerosis. So if we haven't met, my name is Pam Bartha and I'm the author of Become a Wellness Champion and the founder of Live Disease Free. And it's really exciting for me to share this with you because this is a very powerful eating plan and there's a very specific reason why it is so powerful and I'm going to share insights about it. I'm also going to share delicious and healthy meal options, holiday meal options that you will enjoy and your whole family will enjoy. So again, the topic is the best diet for multiple sclerosis refresher. And the reason that I can talk about this topic is that we have helped supported over 600 students in their recovery. Just want to make sure that you guys can hear me. I don't know if it's working here. Just a sec. There we go. All right, I'm just gonna wait a minute because I don't know if it is working or not. Let's see. Oh, okay, super, it is working, okay. Awesome, because sometimes there's a bit of a time lag. So the topic again is the best diet for multiple sclerosis. And we're gonna be talking about the Live Disease Free Eating Plan, what it is, why it's important. So the first thing to consider is that when we want to recover from chronic disease, we want to follow a healthy eating plan. We want to follow something that gives our body a lot of nutrition, but there's more to consider when we are recovering from chronic disease. And the most important thing to consider is that there are a lot of healthy foods, but are there healthy foods that would be better for us and some that we should avoid? And the answer is yes. We first have to consider what we're dealing with when we're dealing with multiple sclerosis. So what kind of, what's the cause? And if you follow my work, you will know that multiple sclerosis is caused by chronic infections in the body. So I have a list on the infections. There's a lot of research that we've collected on our website, livediseasefree.com. So later you can go there and check it out. So look at the research that links multiple sclerosis with parasites, with fungal overgrowth, with Lyme disease. And just, you don't have to go through all the science because it is pretty technical, but you'll see there are a lot of studies showing that MS is caused by infection. Then we have also the wonderful successes of the wellness champions that have recovered from chronic disease, MS in particular. And I've got hundreds of pictures of worms and I'm sharing more and more case studies and just pictures of worms, et cetera, in my presentation. So we can see some of the larger worms we're passing, but we don't see the smaller worms because they would be under a microscope or maybe they're located in the central nervous system. So in coaching over 600 people in the Live Disease Free Academy, the biggest insight we've learned is that, is that, uh, the biggest insight is that the sicker we are, the more infested we are with different types of infections. And we will call it a parasitic infestation because really we're seeing that the more that the students are treating parasites, the quicker they're recovering. That's really important. Why? Because if we want to treat those infections, we have to do some prep work to make their life a little bit miserable. And that really is part of the eating plan. So when we go low, let's backtrack for a sec. So you guys that are on, I can see a lot of your guys are joining right now. So what is the primary food for parasites and fungus and different types of bacteria? What do they thrive on? What's their most favorite food? Go ahead and type it in the question box because I know some of you are wellness champions that are on. So you know the answer to this. I'll just give you a second here. But really... What it is, is that they thrive on carbohydrates and simple sugars. 
So if we eat an eating plan that has a lot of nutrition, but it has a lot of food for those parasites, we're going to feel worse. That is why this live disease free eating plan is so important. We are going low carb. That is the primary reason. It's not that fats are healthy or they're unhealthy or meat is healthy or it's unhealthy or vegetables, etc. It's that if we're really out of balance and we have a lot of infection that is causing the terrible symptoms and the disease label that we have, then if we stop feeding those infections, they're less active, the inflammation starts to go down, our immune system doesn't have to work as hard, we start to have significant symptom improvements, they're still there, if we eat the wrong foods, it can flare it up again. But the key is you're making them less active, you're making them a little weaker, easier to treat, right? And so that's what the Live Disease Free Eating Plan is all about. And that is why these low carb diets are so helpful for not just multiple sclerosis, but also for other chronic diseases. The Live Disease Free Eating Plan takes it a step further in that we have found a target zone and we'll talk about that but that target zone is really where people start to notice a lot more symptom improvement when they get into that target zone so it's not just about eating certain foods it's not just about eating low carb but it's getting into this specific total grams of carbs each day that really helps us to see significant symptom improvements and we have a playlist on youtube live disease free the eating plan. So when you're done here, if this is your first time listening to my work, make sure to head over there and watch them after. It is so incredibly powerful. We see within a week or two time, people notice significant improvements with their bladder function. They're no longer getting up all night long. They might get up once instead of several times, four to six times a night. We see that people sleep better their mood starts to improve. And as I'm gonna share in a few minutes, just one person that's a brand new student, just the, the symptom improvements that he started to realize just by starting to implement what I have online and he didn't even do it perfectly, but now he's a student because he wants to treat the infections. So when we're looking at diets and eating plants, there's a ton out there. There's vegan, there's vegetarian, there's keto, there's paleo, there's low carb, there's high carb, there's low fat, high fat. And really, we have to look at the state of what is going on in our body. That is the key to knowing the best diet for us. Of course, whatever diet we pick, we do want a lot of nutrition. We do want a lot of vitamins and minerals and essential fatty acids and all those important nutrients that our body needs to run off of. But really, the best diet is the one that feeds our body and greatly reduces the food to these infections that are making us sick, so it is low carb. So with respect to the Live Disease Free Eating Plan, I just wanna go over a couple of guidelines. If you have questions, type them in the question box. I'm gonna come back and answer them a little in a little while. And so make sure to type all your questions about the eating plan there. And we are gonna share a link to our blog on livediseasefree.com with some delicious and healthy meal ideas for the holidays. I know that in Canada, we're coming up to the Thanksgiving weekend and I know our American uh, friends are going to be having their Thanksgiving in a few weeks. So it's nice to have some recipes that we can eat that will taste good, but they will not set us back. They will not feed those bad infections a lot and then there's more inflammation and then we feel a lot worse. So we wanna eat healthy and not go backwards with our health and enjoy the food we're eating, obviously. So with respect to the, eat, the guidelines of the eating plan, the Live Disease Free Eating Plan, we are, I'll just talk for a minute about what we avoid and then I'll talk about what we can eat and then I'm gonna go into some specifics. Like these would be insights from coaching hundreds of students what we have seen where sometimes students fall a little short they need to implement a little bit better and it really makes a difference in their feeling better and getting to that place where they're ready to start treating so everything i'm sharing with you is solely for educational purposes for example if you have inflammatory bowel and you can't eat 9 to 13 servings of vegetables especially raw you have to listen to your body, right? Everyone's individual. And what I find for those students is that if they cook saute, like some kind of cooked vegetable, so sauteing, oven roast, stir fry, steaming their vegetables, the ones that agree with them, 
until they start to have the inflammation going down and starting to treat the infections and healing the gut, then they can start to bring in more and more raw. So this training that I'm doing is solely for educational purposes. Things we avoid. Number one is we avoid all the grains, G-R-A-I-N-S. The reason we avoid the grains is that when we have chronic disease, we have this parasitic infestation. We have a lot of inflammation in our digestive tract. We are not digesting the complex carbohydrates, the grains very well. If we don't digest them, they become food for those horrible infections that are making us sick. So we take out all grains. That includes flax. That includes includes chia seeds, that includes amaranth, rice, millet, even the gluten-free grains. So we're going gluten-free, but we're going grain-free. When I first learned about this, I thought, could I even follow this? Because I'm slim and I don't want to become a bag of bones. So I didn't know if I could, could I actually live without eating grains? And actually you can, and you can maintain your weight. You just have to eat enough calories. And we'll talk about that in a minute too. We are avoiding all the grains, which also would include avoiding gluten. We're avoiding all dairy products. We can have butter, the best would be ghee. We are also avoiding all sugar, alcohol, and caffeine for sure. What can we have? We can have many, many low carb vegetables. So we're not gonna have the corn and the peas and the potatoes and the sweet potatoes and the yams. Those are starchy vegetables. So we're not gonna have those because they would take us out of the target zone. We'll talk about the target zone in a minute. So we avoid starchy vegetables, but we're having low carb vegetables. So all the greens, there are so many greens, especially in many different states and countries, etc. right now, where we still have either spring or fall. Kale, Swiss chard, arugula, the different types of lettuces, the iceberg lettuce doesn't have a lot of nutrition in it. But there are so many other types of lettuce that are wonderful. And then we have things like uh, collard greens. And I'm trying to think in our local farms, they're starting to have like yam greens and they have uh, chicory greens. So there's start Asian greens. So you're going to start to see all kinds of different greens becoming more and more popular. They're very, very low carb. Spinach is another one. Uh, so there's lots of different greens and it's great to kind of mix them up so you get a variety of nutrients. So what we're doing right now, because all those other greens are the Asian greens and the chicory greens, we've just been adding them into our salad and making it really taste delicious. And the herbs are really in right now too. So we're chopping a bunch of fresh herbs from these gardens and throwing that in. We moved, we had a really great garden that we started, but we moved so we don't have that. But we do have local farms. I would really encourage you to visit the local farms because the food, the produce that they have at the local farms is so much more nutritious than what you would find in the large, large grocery stores. And of course, some in some months where I live, we have to get our food, our vegetables from the large stores, but whatever you can buy fresh and local is going to have a lot more nutrition. So nutrition is very important, but we're going low carb with the nutrition. So we're going high nutrition and low carb. So the greens really, really important. And then we can eat things like the broccoli and cauliflower and green beans and yellow beans and asparagus and the Chinese vegetables like bok choy and su choy. There's so many different vegetables we can eat. So we are definitely getting rid of the starchy vegetables. We're going off of the grains and off of sugar and no dairy, etc. So nine to 13 servings of vegetables per day, listening to your body. If you have any type of inflammatory bowel disease, consider that. And if something doesn't agree with you, don't eat it. Moderate amounts of protein. So that would be for somebody who's quite sedentary, maybe you are quite disabled, or maybe you have an office job then you might find that three to four ounces or three ounces is enough. Just the amount, the amount of protein is animal protein because that's not going to feed the infections like be dried beans and legumes, etc. So the dried beans, legumes, and soy would contain carbohydrates that we don't digest very well and it would become food for those bad infections that are the biggest base camp is in our intestines but again, when we have chronic disease, those infections have moved into our blood system. 
they've moved into our organs, they've moved into our central nervous system, and that is what those lesions are. They are pockets of infection. So lots of vegetables, moderate amounts of protein, and enough healthy fat to maintain your weight. If you're slim, you're going to have to be very careful that you eat enough calories during the day. And we'll talk about that. But the target, so this is, this is the bottom line. The target zone to this date, what we have found to be the most helpful is to get the total grams of carbs between 35 to 40 per day. How do we measure that? There is a simple app on your phone. It's called the Chronometer, C-R-O Chronometer. You can download it onto your phone and then you can track. You don't have to do this every day, but even for a couple of days. If you just track the total grams of carbs that you're eating, and that would include your fiber, your sugar, and your carbohydrates. And yes, there is sugar in some vegetables like carrots and peppers, for example, and tomatoes. So there are there's going to be a little bit of sugar in some things that we can eat. But the key is to track the total grams of carbs so that you can actually tell if you're in the target zone. We could be eating the foods that are allowed on this eating plan, but we could be eating too many, let's say, carrots, uh, avocados, peppers, tomatoes, let's say beets, for example. So we could have a little bit of beets like shredded on our salad or carrots as a garnish. But if we have large amounts of those ones I just explained, it'll push us over the limit. Especially if we eat a lot at one meal, that'll make our blood sugar go up. It'll feed these infections and then it'll hold us back. We're not going to be improving. We're not going to have that symptom improvement. And at the beginning, these things make all the difference. So again, the target zone is between 35 to 40 total grams of carbs per day. 35 to 40 total grams of carbs per day. That includes fiber, sugar, and carbohydrates. And you can track that with a chronometer. What if you can't afford to lose weight? you have to be really careful with this eating plan. Isn't that wonderful? If you want to lose weight, it's easy. If you don't want to lose weight, you just have to, there's government sites you can look at. How many calories do I need per day to maintain my weight? And so let's say I'm just going to make up 2000 calories just for easy figuring. So then we would say, okay, well, with this eating plan, we want to get 50 to 70% of our calories from fats, from healthier fats. So then I would take however many calories that I need in a day, let's say 2,000, I'm sure it's more, but 2,000 calories times 0.5, because that'll be half, I want to figure out half of the calories I need to get from fat. So that would be about 1,000 calories I need to get from fat. And we know that the, the calories per tablespoon of fat would be about 120. So you would take your 1,000 calories divided by... 120 calories per tablespoon of fat and that'll tell you how many tablespoons of fat you should eat in a day and it might be that you're supposed to eat like six to eight or ten tablespoons of healthy fat during the day and that might sound disgusting but when you add a little bit on your breakfast a little bit on your lunch and your your supper and maybe you have a little bit of dip with your vegetables at snack time you'll find that it can add up really easily and it's really easy to get to that zone and I can tell you that it feels really good to be having your body running on fat, more on fat. It still is going to maintain a specific glucose level, but our body can shift to be more of a fat burner than a sugar burner. And then we really notice that we start feeling a lot better. It's key for longevity. It's key for healing. And so again, we are really getting into that target zone of 35 to 40 total grams of carbs. And if we want to maintain our weight, we just have to eat enough calories. We're decreasing the carbs, we're increasing the healthy fats, and there are a lot of calories in healthy fats. What kind of healthy fats can we eat? So things like olive oil, extra virgin, try to get your oils that are extra virgin and cold pressed. You can use avocado oil or sweet almond oil. There's so many different oils. And also coconut, extra virgin coconut oil. We can have butter. The ideal is to separate the milk solids out of the butter so that you're having ghee, that would just be the, the milk fat. 
And one misconception that I want to talk about right now is that the old school is that a high fat diet leads to heart disease, at least a high cholesterol, possibly high blood pressure also, or maybe salt is in, implement, implicated there also. And so with respect to heart disease, what they're finding is that with heart disease, we're ending up with this buildup of atherosclerosis which is caused by inflammation and the inflammation is caused by infections. So it's really when we're eating a lot of carbs that are feeding the infections and we end up with more of this plaque on our blood vessels, that is what's causing the problem. So whenever our students join this eating plan and they go low carb and they go high fat, their cholesterol normalizes, their blood pressure normalizes, they come off all their medications, they can eat eggs, they can have a couple of eggs a day and not worry about cholesterol, and their heart is a lot healthier for it. So it's really now the newer, I would say in the last five or 10 years, the newer research is showing that it's not healthy fats that are the problem causing heart disease. It is the processed carbohydrates in our diet. That is the problem. And we're getting rid of those in the Live Disease for Eating plan. All right, so that takes care of how to maintain my weight. So for people like myself, if I miss a snack and I miss or miss a meal, I'll lose weight. And it's kind of the opposite problem of what most of society has nowadays is that we're, you know, we're starving ourselves because we want to lose weight. Well, with this eating plan, you have to eat and you have to eat. You feel very satisfied on this eating plan, but you have to make sure that you're not missing meals, that you are eating enough. And it's your platefuls too. So very often we're used to having small platefuls of food because we're eating more uh, the carbohydrate dense foods. But now when you're eating vegetables, which are low calories, then you have to eat bigger platefuls. And some of our students, they are quite nauseous. They don't have a good appetite because they're really sick when they start and they join us. So for those students, they just have to persist and they just eat a little bit more and a little bit more day after day. And after a while, they're eating the right foods and their their appetite is coming back and they can eat a lot more. At the start, maybe they'll have to eat four smaller meals a day instead of three bigger meals, whatever it takes, but you just have to eat enough, right? And that is the key, is that figure out how many grams of fat and then making sure you don't miss protein, with your meal, protein, healthy fats, and lots of vegetables for each meal. So for breakfast, not just a couple of eggs. Have a plate full of greens, pour on the olive oil, have your eggs with that, and the greens could be steamed, they can be raw. You can add herbs, you can dress it up however you like to make it taste good and different, but there's lots of variety, which is awesome. And this is an eating plan that is, it's like an anti-aging eating plan, so it's awesome. All right, so looking here just to see if there's any other things. Um, can't afford to lose weight. Baked goods. So this is a really big bone of contention for some people. So when, when we're really sick, we crave the foods that make us sick. So we really crave baked things and noodles and carbohydrates. So some students... They're just like, is there anything that I can bake? Can I use nut flour? Can I use some other type of flour that is lower carb? And the answer is no. In the recovery phase, and this is if you want to recover from serious chronic disease, in the recovery phase, it's really important to eat food in as close to its natural state as possible. So we avoid sausage and ham and bacon because there's usually the vast majority of time there is added sugar and or fillers and it's not always listed on the label and we have seen that it really impacts their recovery. So we will eat real meat that has not been soaked in a brine, it's just you know plain meat and we'll spice it up with our own herbs and our seasoning that is plain seasoning, it's not a blend which has maltodextrin in it. But we can have fresh ginger and garlic and all the beautiful herbs, fresh or dried, and, that's, and then adding enough healthy fat, that really gives it a lot of flavor. But it's very important that we avoid anything that has been processed in any way because we run the risk of it being contaminated with things that will feed the infections and really prevent us from moving forward. And the baked goods is really something that we avoid because even if we use nut flour or coconut flour, 
even though that the coconut flour might be a little lower carbs, for example, and it's not a disaccharide, it's not like a grain, it's a little different, but it's so challenging to keep the total grams of carbs between 35 to 40 and to eat thir- 9 to 13 servings of vegetables a day. So that's why we would like to get rid of any foods that is that are not really nutritious. So we wouldn't have any of the nut milks or the right well of course we're not having rice milk but the nut milks and what other kind of milks a coconut milk we would avoid all of those because we're just using up our carbohydrates and we want to save those carbohydrates for if i said calories before i meant carbohydrates so we want to save the carbs for the nutritious vegetables that have lots of vitamins and minerals inside of them that will feed our body And also the fiber, like we want to create an environment inside of us where the good microbes want to live. They want to make a home again, because when we're sick, we have too many parasites, fungus, and bad bacteria. So we want to definitely feed the good microbes with just the healthy fiber that's in our low carbohydrate uh, vegetables. So we would definitely avoid all the baked goods. Another Big thing is most people are using smoothies when they start, before they start working with us. The problem with smoothies is that when we grind up fruits and vegetables, it's like pre-digesting the carbohydrates and natural sugars, and it can cause our blood sugar to go up more quickly. And every time our blood sugar goes up, then it's feeding the infections throughout the body, whether they're in our blood, whether they're in our organs, whether they're in the central nervous system. So we want to maintain as steady of a blood sugar level and we want to actually have um, have it so that it's even a little lower. It's still, it's we're not in any kind of danger zone. We're just in a really healthy zone. We don't have to measure it. We don't have to measure our ketones or anything like that. But we're just trying to maintain a steady blood sugar level that really helps us to get to the place through the prep phase so that we're ready to treat. All of this, what we're doing is building up the body and weakening the infection so we're ready to start treating because the only way we can really recover is to treat those parasites, not just to weaken them with diet, but this is the very first most important step to get there. So we avoid all smoothies, even if they have stevia and like most of the smoothies, if they're botten, they are usually synthetic vitamins, which we would avoid also because high doses of synthetic vitamins can actually feed certain infections. So we would avoid all of that. And we just chew our food. Dr. Klinghard taught us that when we're chewing our food, the action of our teeth clenching, it actually opens up our brain to detox itself. So that is one way that our brain is actually detoxing itself. So it's very important that we chew our food. It's a wonderful experience, so it's important. And even things like carrots that are ground up and a little bit of fruit, it is going to make, it is going to affect our blood sugar level. So we don't have any juices, smoothies. We're just eating real food. And it tastes awesome too. It tastes great. All right. And I talked about inflammatory bowel disease. I know that there has a really, there's been a really big shift or interest in going away from the, you know, eating animal protein and eating solely plant source diet. So vegan and vegetarian. I understand that there are ethical reasons for that. I totally get it. I understand that the the food industry, they're, they're doing things to our, not just our, the animal protein, but and animal products, but also our vegetables. And it's very disturbing and very disheartening. But When we're infested with parasites, which would be worms, big and small, and protozoa and others, and fungal overgrowth and bacteria, and we're and we're just following a solely plant sourced diet, and if we're really sick, so this is for people that are really sick, really out of balance, having these infections, it is really, really hard to get enough calories and enough protein, the essential amino acids, when we can't have the dried beans and the legumes and the soy and all those other vegetarian proteins that we would get. And we're not having the grains. So I know that we get different amino acids from different sources of plants. 
So when you take out all the grains and you take out all the dried beans and legumes, then you find that you're not going to get all the amino acids and are, and it's really challenging to keep your weight on if you're just eating low carb vegetables with healthy fat, it's not healthy. And so it's really important that people are, you know, getting enough calories, getting all the amino acids they need and maintaining their muscle mass and treating the infections. There are students that I work with that are vegetarian, but they will have some eggs, they might have some fish, and they can still recover that way. So they're still having animal protein. But keep in mind that this live disease free eating plan is mostly vegetables. We're eating heaping platefuls of vegetables with very moderate amounts of protein. It might be three to four ounces, whatever you need, depending on how active you are but it's mostly plant source. So, and, and so we would use the animal protein, let's say if you don't really love meat, you haven't eaten it for a while, but you'll, you wanna do whatever it takes to get better, then it could be just sprinkling a little bit on your salad so that you're having mostly vegetables and then the beautiful lemon juice or lime juice and olive oil, and it's a great mix of flavors. So that's very important to note too. So those are some of the important insights that we've had. I'm going to go to your questions right now. All right. Hi, Maureen. Hi, Michela. Hi, Rochelle. Hello, Facebook user. I don't know who you are. Michael. Hi. Hi, Mary Lou. Hi, Sue. And let's see the questions here. Rick. Hello, Rick and Marianne. Awesome that you're watching. It's working. Yay. All right. So here we go to the so Tina is wondering, vegetarians and a low carb diet, it's, as I mentioned, it's very, very challenging to follow vegan. You could do vegetarian, but vegan, it's really, really hard because people would not get enough um, animal protein. And I mean, you can try to treat these infections with vegan, but we have found that the students are just so frustrated. It just doesn't work. They just don't feel well because you have to eat a lot of foods that will feed the infections on the vegan diet. And it's not that the vegan diet is bad. If you follow it properly and you make sure you supplement and you're not short on things like, you know, amino acids or uh, vitamin B12, et cetera, you could do it. But the key is you have to, um, if you're really out of balance and dealing with chronic disease, then it's very difficult we don't have a magic pill cure to treat these parasites. It's not like we can just take a two week course of one pill. If you've watched any of my work, make sure to go back and listen after to the infection playlist but, and my masterclass training. But what we found is that the sicker we are, we're out of balance with several different infections. So we will have very large worms. We'll have protozoa, single-celled parasites. We could have these small worms in the central nervous system. We have different types of fungi. So it's not like a one pill cure. And the doses that we're taking of these treatments, they are more helpful than the herbs by themselves, but they're not strong enough to completely eradicate our body. And that has to do with you know how concentrated they're getting into our body and in our central nervous system are they crossing the blood brain barrier if they have to the reason we're so behind in treating parasites in human is because our doctors are not allowed they're not trained to recognize parasite infestations they don't they've never used the parasite drugs other than maybe something like parental palm weight for pinworms that's pretty much it maybe Diflucan for a yeast infection, but that's pretty much it. And so they can't recognize the infections and we really haven't spent a lot of time in treating these infections. And that's why it's so hard to find a practitioner that will help you. Is veggies cooked in a stew okay? Yes, you can do that. Um, what we would do is we would use beef and you can brown it and you can throw in some bay leaves and some onions and carrots and celery. Be careful though with stews, like if you add a lot of carrots, when you cook them, they become high glycemic. So remember carrot is like a garnish. So you could add a lot of other vegetables into your stew, like celery would be low carb, um, green beans, some broccoli, like you can go through the list. There's different Chinese vegetables. If I would do a stew, I like them more when they're not, like the vegetables aren't like totally mushy, but 
it's totally possible. What about cabbage? Rochelle's wondering. Yes, cabbage is fine. Cabbage would be a little bit higher in the carbs, kind of like Brussels sprouts, etc. So you just have to pay attention. You just say, okay, I've had this much shredded cabbage today and you track it on the chronometer. Like one of our students said, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that one cup of Brussels sprouts is 11 grams of carbs. That's almost one third of the total grams of carbs for the day. So that's why we wouldn't be having two cups of Brussels sprouts with one meal. We can, And this is where when I'm eating, I always bring in lots of leafy things, the greens along the side, and while I'm having at least two good servings of other vegetables. All right, and the healthy Thanksgiving meal ideas, um, Danielle posted that in our feed, up, so you guys can go there later on. I just want to quickly mention um, some of them that we have there. So there is uh, crispy prosciutto wrapped asparagus which is delicious we've had that before and another one would be oven roasted carrots so again you oven roast them tender crisp and I would have a small serving of this I wouldn't have a huge serving of this on the side so it'd be more of a taste but there's lemon ginger broccoli there is also creamy mashed cauliflower Again, when I have this on a holiday meal, like our whole family loves it, it's where you, you steam the cauliflower and you process it so that it's like mashed potatoes. But it's fine to have like a small serving, like a half a cup to a cup, but don't have four cups of it, right? Because then you're, you are going to concentrate the carbs more. But that is a real popular favorite. And then of course, rust, uh, roasted Brussels sprouts are always popular and there's also a colorful kale salad we love kale salads too so those are a few different recipes that you could use as a couple of side dishes on your holiday thanksgiving or whatever holiday you have uh, which are really awesome delicious recipes i wanted to share with you like today because i'm talking to people all the time whether it's my students in the academy whether it's new students whether it's people that are looking to join so one person that I chatted with today is a new student. So whenever someone joins, I always like to connect with them. I want to know what they've been through, what their diagnosis is, what their health history is, answer all their questions as they're joining the Live Disease Free Academy. So this is a student in the UK, and I just chatted with him today. He watched, before he joined the Academy, he watched my videos on YouTube. He watched the eating plan videos. He started to make changes in his diet. So he didn't do it perfectly, but he implemented everything that I've shared. And I do share everything that I can. But what I found is that it doesn't matter how much I share with my students, I still check their work. So they implement really well in the academy. They, they, there's a ton of FAQs and meal ideas and shopping list and uh, lots of information there that they go through and they think, okay, I know what I'm doing. I'm following it properly they'll fill in their lesson one workbook activity and then they'll send it to me and I'll give them feedback. So there's always things that they can adjust and very often those small adjustments make a huge shift. So for this one student, even though he didn't follow it perfectly, but he probably followed it quite well, he ended up, he shared with me that he was following the eating plan about four weeks before he joined and he noticed a lot of major changes already in him so he's feeling a lot stronger he's already able to transfer himself more easily off the wheelchair he has less paralysis in his left hand and he has small improvements in his bladder and fu bladder function so now that he's in the academy he's going to make those fine adjustments and i i know that his bladder function is going to improve a lot more we have that all the time and he'll have more symptom improvement and this is part of the prep phase to recover He's going to follow the eating plan. He's going to work through the checklist for healing to make sure he's, you know, opening up detox pathways, decreasing toxins, strengthening his body, and then he's going to start treating. And so that's lesson three where we do build a game plan to treat. That's really the only way to recover is you have to treat the infections. And I also wanted to share a couple of trends. Um, I'll just finish off the questions here. All right, see if there's any other questions. Okay, I think, let's see. 
I have to I always have to try to figure out which way is up here. So Elizabeth, how can one get nine to 13 servings of vegetables every day without exceeding the 50 grams of carbs? So that's a little bit of practice. Again, you're you're bringing in a lot of the leafy greens and moderate amounts of the other vegetables that are low carb. All right, so the leafy greens are really, really low carb. So a lot of the students are saying that they're eating buckets of different salads. So it's not just, you know, those little containers of plastic containers of lettuce that don't really have a lot of flavor, but they're incorporating a lot of different types of greens, but they are still having other vegetables throughout the day. So it, it totally can be done. Absolutely. So Christy, you do keto and your neurologist is happy with that. So I'm not sure like what type of keto you're following, but I know with the traditional keto diet, they can have dairy products and we would not have dairy products. And another problem with the keto diet is that we like, it's easy to eat a lot of fat and animal protein and not to eat enough vegetables because the keto diet is even lower carb. And we found there's great benefit in having extra vegetables for the nutrition. So we're going a little bit higher carb than keto, but we're having a lot more healthy vegetables and we're not having any dairy products. So Rochelle, we wouldn't have any quinoa because that is a grain. It is not, um, it is a higher protein grain, but it still is a grain. So it definitely would be avoided in the recovery phase. It is a healthy grain, but if we're really out of balance and really sick, it will feed the infections. We won't digest it well enough. And this Facebook user is getting two to four worms a day nonstop since July, releasing them. So I'm not sure who you are, but the important thing is that when we get to the treatment phase in the Live Disease Free Academy, it's important that, that we're treating from the top down and from the bottom up. So we can use the oxidizing agents to do enemas to release worms through the large intestine, out of the large intestine, but we also have to treat the small intestines, which would be over 20 feet long. Otherwise, if we just treat the bottom, our large intestine, and we do not treat the small intestine, the worms are mating upstream and they will keep releasing new worms. They can lay hundreds, if not thousands of eggs in a day. So we have to definitely treat both ways. And with the treatments, a lot of them have moved into our blood and into the central nervous system. So we have to treat more s systemically. So Elizabeth, will the Live Disease Free Cookbook be available? I We're working on it uh, with this whole COVID thing. And there's just a lot more to cookbooks than we realize. We have all the recipes, um, just finishing testing them. We have reached out to some different publishers. We're just figure, trying to figure out the best way to get it out. And then we still have to do a whole bunch of pictures. It's like crazy amount of work for a cookbook. But we're excited. The recipes are great. Um, Chris is an amazing chef. You'll really enjoy the flavors that he's put together there. How many grams of protein and healthy fats should I consume? So again, I shared, Jared, as far as the protein, it depends on how active you are. If you eat very large amounts of protein, your body will convert that to glucose. So you'll have a higher blood sugar level, which will feed the infection. So we don't do high amounts of protein. We do just what we feel we're satisfied. So for an active guy, it might be four to five ounces. For somebody who's more sedentary, it might be three ounces. But when you're following this, you'll know how you feel. And the key is to really have a plate full of vegetables. So for example, with the Thanksgiving, we're going to have that this weekend. We're going to have a turkey because we love turkey. And when we have things like Brussels sprouts or even the carrots, I will only have like a couple of carrots. And I'm not dealing with MS, but I just know that I'm not going to eat a ton of carrots when they're cooked. They're high glycemic. The rest of the family love them. But it's fine to have a couple. And I'll have more broccoli. And I will have, sometimes we'll take the, the gravy from the turkey and not thicken it. So you know, for some of my family member, because we have brothers and sisters and parents that are that are not following the eating plan. So they will thicken some of the gravy for them, but they'll leave it runny for me and I'll pour that over vegetables too. So that tastes really good. But I'll have, we, I always make sure that I have like a green leafy salad alongside and I'll, you know, make it look pretty with the way I cut up the vegetables and add different vegetables to it. But I always have like a heaping part of my plate will be the green leafy vegetables. And I pour the olive oil on. So 
even when I'm going to restaurants, I'll ask for an extra side of olive oil or butter, etc. Because usually they don't give you enough fat because a lot of people traditionally were like low, low fat. So I'll always ask for additional extra virgin olive oil or butter, etc. for my meals. And I'll add lots on it. So that's really where I get my the satisfied. And when you shift your body from a, being a sugar burner to being more of a fat burner, you find that if you ever ate a meal that is like once you're well and you ever eat a meal that's just more carbs, you find you're just not satisfied. It's, re- it's like the total opposite, right? It's pretty crazy. But it's very satisfying, this eating plan. And then so the healthy fats... It really depends on, you know, how how many calories you need in a day, Jared. So again, figure out how many calories you need for your age, male, female, what type of work you do. Divide that by half and then divide that by the 120, I believe I said, 120 um, calories per tablespoon of fat. And that'll kind of give you a ballpark idea. And sometimes people even add a little bit of MCT oil in their tea because it doesn't taste like anything and it just gives them extra fat calories. Another thing is like a homemade mayonnaise with using lemon juice and or apple cider vinegar. You can make it into a spicy mayo. You can make it into herb herbs like a garden type mayo. You can do whatever you want with it, but that is really great. Chimichurri is another great thing to add on to meats where it's oil and different herbs and maybe a little bit of the lemon juice or apple cider vinegar that you can put on top of your vegetables. I'm sure we have a chimichurri recipe on our website, Live Disease Free also. Maybe we can stick that in the, um, if Danielle's listening, maybe you can stick it into the feed also for this video. What, what can I drink other than water, Vicky's asking? There are so many wonderful herb teas. There is peppermint, there's chamomile, there's different types of rooibos that are not sweet. Just avoid any herbal teas that would have apple flavor or some kind of fruit flavor. Anything that tastes sweet, we would avoid licorice too. Anything that tastes sweet, don't put it in your mouth. You can have them cold, you can have them hot. So there's lots of herb teas. There's also great sparkling waters right now. There's so many different companies. You can find them everywhere. There's LaCroix, there's Bubbly, there's many others. And they have lots, and just try to get some that are naturally flavored, like that they're not synthetic flavored or chemical flavored, but just natural flavors. And uh, they're delicious. So you can have those for sparkling or even just plain Perrier San Pellegrino plain and put some fresh lemon, fresh lime in it. I personally don't drink them all the time because I think that they're hard on your enamel if you drink them daily all the time. So I love fresh water. You kind of get in a different habit of just drinking water. And then, you know, especially at night or if it's cooler outside, I'll have a tea. And again, there's tons and tons of beautiful herb teas. Try to go more organic with those because there can be toxins in the tea bags or in the tea but lots of great options there. Hi, Danny. What about sauerkraut? That's a great question. So with respect to sauerkraut, that is the only fermented food that our students will use at the start. We would avoid things that would have a lot of natural yeast in them. So like kimchi and kombucha. Well, kombucha is a sugar ferment and it would have caffeine from the tea. So we would avoid that. But the kimchi and kefirs would have a lot more, uh, would have some natural yeast and we would avoid that because those yeasts will not cause a yeast infection. But usually when we have chronic disease, we are infested with fungal overgrowth also, which is one of the types of parasites. And so when we bring, when we eat foods that are from fungal, you know, like different types of natural yeast, there will be components that we have inside of us that could benefit the yeast. And also we're sensitive to yeast. So we just avoid all mushrooms and all yeast products or that would have a potential. Raw sauerkraut seems to be tolerated really well. If you make it yourself, that is the healthiest because you can do a wild ferment, meaning that you take organic vegetables, you chop them up fine, you ferment them for anywhere between 10 days or a few more days, depending on how warm your house is. And then you are amplifying the microbes that are growing on the cabbage and other vegetables. It's mostly cabbage, but those microbes, the the natural diverse populations of different types of microbes, they are growing and growing and multiplying. And then you get a real true good probiotic, like the best available. 
So with probiotics, we would definitely really avoid prebiotics. So Crystal, you were recently diagnosed with uh, severe rheumatoid arthritis. Your dad has multiple sclerosis. I'm so sorry, diagnosed in 97. S uh, sadly, he's too far into his disease. I honestly feel that you're never too far, but your dad has to be open to this. We have students that have had MS since in the 90s, so they're anywhere between 28 to 30 years, and two of them are starting to walk again. They are on their 12th treatment cycle, and they at first it was like just a lot of improvements. One of them, she couldn't even use her hand, and now she can use her hand again, and she can grip things, she has strength, and now she's starting to walk. Both of them are starting to walk. Are we gonna get better at treating? Absolutely. I just wish this wasn't our job. I wish that there were doctors all over the world that were helping people to treat these infections because we could go a lot quicker with figuring out, are there you know common, common parasites that would be, you know, that we need to treat, or maybe we could do combinations of treatments or, you know, we, we know a lot and we are having amazing results, but if we worked at this as a global agenda, a, a task to all of us to do, we would help people recover a whole lot more quickly. And that is the whole point of the work that I do is I hope you guys share this with other people, share it with other groups, because we have to get the word out. We have to get the word out that MS is caused by infection. And then we do the specific steps to make ourselves ready to treat and then treat. As far as rheumatoid arthritis, Crystal, it is caused by infections in your body. It's just that certain microbes like to live in different parts of the body. Some of, some of the microbes like to live in our joints. Some like to live in our reproductive organs. Some like to live just stay in the gut. Some move into the central nervous system. Some like to live in our breasts. Some, and that's where we get the cysts and the lumps. In our abdominal cavity, we end up with, with uh, endometriosis and the, the flarial worms that they're finding in multiple sclerosis that Dr. Alan McDonald found. If you haven't seen that, you need to watch that lecture. It's short and it's very powerful. So it's a state of dysbiosis. We're out of balance. There was a time in our life we were on a little bit too many antibiotics and then whatever we were exposed to, whatever microbes were in our environment, they had a chance to become too populated in our body and they move into the areas where they like to live. And so they have linked parasites with rheumatoid arthritis, but also other bacteria, protists, etc. As you treat them, just want to make sure, as you treat them, you will recover. And your dad, you know, if he's open to this, he can have a lot of recovery. I can never promise full recovery, but people always have more recovery than they thought possible. And that is a huge improvement in their quality of life. All right, so I think that is it as far as I'm going to um, answer questions because we're getting close to an hour here. I also wanted to share some trends that I'm seeing. So I just did a masterclass training. I do that three times a year. We had over 1,600 people register for it. If you haven't watched it yet, please make sure you do if, if you're interested in treating infections. And it's how myself and many wellness champions are living MS symptom-free. So what, and then we've had a lot of students joining us and I would say that close to 25% of the students that have joined just in the last little while here are healthcare professionals that are recovering from chronic disease, largely MS, but other chronic disease too. We are starting to see ALS students more and Parkinson's more of those types of students also. So what is really exciting is that you know, when a student joins and they're a nurse and we've had our first medical doctor join, it's really exciting because when they recover, they really get it. They really understand why their patients are sick and they don't need to learn about the parasite drugs and they don't need to learn and build up a belief. They know firsthand what was making them so sick. And being part of this community, they just see all the other students and the successes they're having. It's just quite shocking. So that's one trend that I've noticed. Another trend that I've noticed, and this is a really sad trend, is that we're seeing a lot more young people that are joining the program in their 30s. When I started this years and years ago, most of my students were 45, 55, 65, I would say more of 55 and up, 55 to 65 years old, and mostly women. Um, I don't know, I think women just tend to, to want to jump on board and, and treat these infections quicker. 
men for sure, but more women than men are proactive with their health. And that's our, been our experience. We would love to serve any gentleman that wants to treat. And we do have gentlemen in our program. But so with respect to the trend is that we're seeing a lot of people that are in their 30s with multiple sclerosis. So I don't know if we're seeing young, more and more younger people coming down with MS. I wouldn't be surprised uh, just because of the state of our health, the state of the, the toxins we're dealing with in the world. But that is a trend that we're seeing. We're serving a lot more younger people and even in their 20s, 20s and 30s. The last trend I wanted to share that we're seeing is that we're helping a lot more people that don't have a diagnosis yet. So I was speaking with one lady today and she ha she was tested for MS. She's got a lot of awful MS or neurological symptoms. So she's dealing with neurological symptoms that kind of sound like they would be MS, but they checked her for that and they don't think that it's MS. They also checked her for rheumatoid arthritis and they don't believe she has that. And now they're saying L ALS. And so these people that are trying to get a diagnosis, they come across our work and they're like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense that I'm dealing with infections, that infections are causing my symptoms. And they're like, I don't want to wait for a diagnosis. I don't even really want a diagnosis. And some people with their work, they do not want that diagnosis. So they're joining the program even before they're having a diagnosis. They might have five to seven or 10 symptoms of neurological symptoms associated with one of these horrible neurological diseases. And they're like, I want to just treat them, get on with my life. So one young man who just finished his first parasite treatment, he is in that boat and he's finished the program. I think he's done about three months in. He's done one treatment cycle. He's very close to being symptom free in his first treatment cycle. And it's really exciting. And I really hope that we can help more people that don't even have a diagnosis, but maybe, or maybe they've just recently been diagnosed because the sooner you treat these infections, the easier it is to treat. It still takes work, but it's not as difficult as if you've had these infections for 20 or 30 years and the quicker we can recover and the less treatment cycles we need. Like we can just get on with our life a little bit earlier if we implement well with all the steps in the program. All right, so um, hope you enjoy those recipes. Uh, make sure to test them out and let me know what you think. And next week, what I'd like to do, because talking about these trends, I'd really like to do a video about, do I have MS? So for people that are possibly, you know, having these symptoms, they're, they're going to a neurologist, very often it takes quite a while, several months to get a real firm diagnosis. But what do we have to consider? Like if, if there's a possibility that we have multiple sclerosis and this involves a lot of things as far, and it involves things like the MRI, sometimes the lumbar puncture or spinal tap and just understanding, you know, what's going on. And if we can catch more people early, it'll save so much pain and agony and cost and time and they can get on with their life so much quicker. So I really hope that I you got a lot out of this call or out of this training today. And if you would like to join my other trainings, maybe you haven't subscribed yet to YouTube, Live Disease Free, make sure to subscribe, hit the notification bell so that you'll know when I'm hosting the next live training. And please help us get the word out. Please like and share this video. And for next week, like if you have multiple sclerosis and you've recovered or you're on the journey to recover and you want to share this with other groups, please share that one, for, especially for next week so that we can catch people early and help them to recover so they don't have to go through all the pain and agony of dealing with an awful disease and not just MS, but any other chronic disease. So with that, oh, and... If you haven't watched my masterclass training, you'll see that there will, will be a link in the feed here if you want to learn more about treating infections and becoming a wellness champion and enjoy the healthy recipes and check me out on YouTube, Live Disease Free. Watch some of the videos if you're new. Until next week, take care and bye-bye for now.